And hello, everybody, and welcome to another Adobe Live. Happy Friday uh, to all of you, and nice to see so many of you in the chat already. Plenty of our regulars here, Kirsty, Sandrine, Gareth, Steve, uh, so many, Sean, loads and loads. It's really difficult, getting longer and longer, more and more difficult all the time to say hello to you, but hello, everybody. Now, if you've never been here before, and if you're watching on YouTube, that's just fine. But if you want to get involved with the community and you want to ask questions from me or my fabulous guest today, then uh, please do come along and join us at Adobe. Uh, sorry, behance.net slash Adobe Live. I was having a moment then. My URLs disappeared from the screen. Not like I should know them anyway. So today we are joined by Gabriella Marcella. Am I saying that correctly, Gabriella? Good morning. Perfect. Hi, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, all good, thank you. Fluffing my lines, but there we go. <laughs> all really good. Lovely to see you here. So you're up in Glasgow, right? How is it up there today? It's overcast, very normal. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is like normal, but I'm hoping it's going to warm up later. We'll see. Well, I'm down in Cambridge and it is very, very warm. We're over 30 degrees already and it's not even lunchtime yet. So it's quite warm, but there we are. So still nice. Good. I hope wherever you are uh, and whatever the weather's like, uh, it's you're having a great day. So Gabriella, tell us a little bit more about yourself. For those of our audience who have never met you before, or go ahead. So I run a Resograph print studio based here in Glasgow. And for those of you who don't know, Resograph is like a mixture between screen printing and photocopying. So it looks like a photocopier, but it works like a screen printer, a stencil. Um, it works on stencils, basically. So I'm a graphic designer by trade, or by trade, by studying. I don't know what you call that. Like, anyway, I studied as a graphic designer. And then I started using the printer to sort of output a lot of um, my work, which was then a lot of posters, which the Resograph is really great for. It's really good for bright, colorful, promotional, not too precious, um, colorful print. It's really tactile. Mm. So it's Gorgeous, really rich color. Yeah, so it's yeah. really informed my, my design process. And so I've been doing that for eight years i started risotto eight years ago so a lot has changed since then but it's still very much um at the heart of all the outputs is the sort of print process um so yeah no, that's i love the name of your business by the way very clever <laughs> very clever it's hard when you call up like um paper companies and they just get really confused at why it's a rice dish but i try i'm now just like cruising past i try and just I used to get really caught up and be really insecure about it, but now it's fine. Yeah, people are much better on names these days than they yeah. used to be. In the 80s, I traded as Dangerous Hamster in the 80s. Good, and that was a toss up between Dangerous Hamster and Satan's Pants. I went with Dangerous Hamster and uh, and that was the same thing we're calling up suppliers. And in the 80s, they were much less tolerant because everybody was like so-and-so and associates and all of these different yeah, things. Yeah. No, yours is super clever and really nice. So I like it. I like plays on things. Really good. So what are you going to be showing us today then, Gabriella? So I thought I would show um, of the process of doing my mini calendars. So these are um, what I... So I do products through the studio every year. So we have print service, but I also design and make stationery. So the mini calendars basically has 12 different um, patterns that are then visa printed in four colors. So I was going to talk you through a bit of the process from designing the patterns and the layers and then preparing them for print. So essentially making color separations, turning them into grayscale and then to output into these spot color printing. Um, so that was my plan. Oh, no, excellent. Well, it's all yours. <laughs> the, um, the yeah, no, the stage is all yours. Yeah. Take it away. I'll dip in with some questions. Don't forget, if you've got your questions for Gabriella, then go ahead, pop them in the chat, and I could just jump in and, <laughs> and interject whenever needed. Okay, go okay. ahead. So can you, you can see my screen? Yes. Great. So this, I've just opened up a few different Illustrator files. I work pretty much always in Illustrator. Um, but as I was saying earlier, I feel like I probably use like five of the same tools. So I'm sure a lot of you will 
see so many shortcuts that I could be doing. So I'm open to um, your feedback. So this is kind of normally how I start working. I'll sort of draft um, and design a lot of different compositions, um, which I then start to like organize because currently there's like loads and loads of layers that I try and keep organized into um, groups and stuff. But I kind of do, as, as I sort of get more closer to the, the final product, or the final designs, I, I get neater as I go. So just to give you a quick overview of where I'll sort of show you around today, this is okay. kind of like phase one, and then I get to like phase two, which is a bit neater. Where Can you I'm, put the calendar together itself in, illus in uh, Illustrator? You yeah, actually I put it all in Illustrator. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, so basically, the Riso Grass is A3, so I always basically work on these A3 artboards and then create, I have like these templates that I've like pre-made up with like my bleed and my um, crop marks. But yeah, this is, Illustrator is my like, my home. And then from there basically, so I've like isolated my, my patterns and then they're kind of organized here and then I make them grayscale and then they get printed. So this, so going back to the beginning, basically, let's see, for example, I'm gonna just pull up, I'm gonna select this print, which is like buried in here. Yeah. So essentially this is made up of lilac polka dots. I'm gonna just start turning stuff off so you can see. Wait, can you still, is it a bit weird? Yeah, no, no, it's all good. It's all good. Okay, great. So we've got like these lilac polka dots and then there's a peach gradient and then there's whoop, a teal and green zigzag things, which then all combined create this print. Wow. So it's all, for me, it's like always to do with um, using the multiply because this basically recreates on screen what Resograph inks do, because Resograph inks, um, what's it called? They've got, they're very, they're transparent or translucent. Yeah. Transparent. Yeah. But when you print on top of stuff, you get blends. So essentially, whenever I design, the multiply effect is normally on every layer. So yeah. I can sort of see what blends. So in using four colors, you can still get like the, where the purple um, overlays, or like here, for example, where you've got a bit of a lilac tint that goes to the peach, you get all these sort of different tones. Um, so, oh yeah, here I have, so I've input my little, I've got my little swatches here, um, that I have all the Rezo spot colors. So then I can sort of use that as my palette. So I'll like make an artwork and then I'll maybe, I use this a lot actually as well. Yeah, the recolor artwork tool. Yeah, yeah. Tool, this tool. Like really help sort of play around with like how it might look. Sometimes with this one, and I'm just like quite trigger happy, and it's quite fun to sort of see how all the di it's kind of nice because it sort of will just give me quick um, options of things I've maybe not con like preconceived. It's quite nice that mm. it's um, a bit more of like a roulette in terms of like colorways. Um, but essentially, everything is vector like a vector of artwork. So in this one, for example, these are all very, I've already organized these, but I've actually got a, a file open that I can show you in a second that's not organized and I can show you how to organize it. But I don't know if that's interesting. No, it is, it is, absolutely it is. Um, you, 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 uh, you stunned people, by the way, by the level of artboards and layers you've oh. got in that document. But no, 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 no negative. They're just going, wow, lots and lots of, uh, of artboards just there. Uh, yeah. Gareth is asking, uh, do the grayscales to do the color separations through the resograph? Yeah. And uh, Jackie's asking, uh, I can actually answer this one for you. Does Gabriella have her own resograph at her home studio? Yes, she does have a shop and a lovely place in Glasgow. And if you check out her website, um, Tim will just pop the link into the chat for me uh, or for us. Uh, you can have a look at that and you can see, you can actually see Gabriella at work. There you are. <laughs> Great. Yeah. So, I mean, having the having the printer, like as a, as a tool that I've got on hand has been amazing just in terms of being able to test stuff and a lot of my work, I'm not very precious about my work, which is hard when I sort of do end up doing any high end stuff. Cause I'm really, I like to work quite fast and ex like 
to sort of trial and error because the, the printer basically you can do all these sort of um mock-ups but when it prints it's really hard to know exactly how it will turn out because yeah for example different opacities like here's basically the uh the grayscale separations for for example i'll try and find oh yeah this was one that was in march so for example yeah. i've like blocked it into so this is the pink layer and i've set this at like i think this is probably about 25 percent here this block I'm like yep. pointing at my screen as if you can see me pointing, but I'll use my arrow. Um, so the pink layer, what's that one? The yellow. The yellow you can always go quite dark with because it's such a, a light ink. And then the red and then the blue. Um, so essentially I go through from that first art, from this first like chaos to like yeah. then start grouping. Um, do you ever do you ever use the separations preview in Illustrator? Have you ever? No. Oh right. So where you are now, because this won't hurt your artwork. So if you don't mind, yeah. so where you are now, if you go to the window menu up at the top of the screen, okay, and from there uh, go down to separations preview, just there, okay. Uh, you'll need to be in overprint preview mode, right? So you can actually do that from the view menu. So go to the view menu. Go to overprint preview. It's just at the top there. At the top, and you should actually, if you've got solid colours in there, that's interesting. Maybe I have. So this is this layer. Let's ah, see. everything's got multiply on it. Is that maybe why? Ah, uh, it might might actually. No, that shouldn't really affect it. But you, uh, it might be because it's an uh, it's an RGB document. Ah. That'll be why it won't show it. But if it was a CMYK document, or you changed it, then you'd be able to actually view the separations. Oh. Oh from God. there so you could turn off the cmyk plates if there were any but there's not you can just see awesome. all of your different colors oh yeah you could turn the cmyk ones they were they were right at the top mm. just turn those off or maybe my inks weren't all actually in the spot colors yeah but anyway for, i just wondered if you used it but i mean maybe for later you could try that out then you can view exactly how they're printing that would would i be able to export like only the burgundies uh, you can do that anyway. You can actually do that. Um, you can do that by exporting it to PDF, and you can export separations. But I could, I'll chat to you about that offline. Okay. Because normally, what I do is I manually turn off layers. Yeah. And then make sure all the teal ones are there. I've converted them to grayscale to save. Yeah. There's probably ways I can totally speed that up. We we can uh, actually we've got a Tony Harmer show coming up in a couple of weeks. We can do that on there, I guess. But, <laughs> yeah. Sounds good. So. What I was going to do was talk you through this as one print. I don't know um, if this would make sense. So it's not so chaotic and you can kind of see a process of like grouping. And then this essentially is the final, this is the final artwork. Yeah. So I can show you um, how I've then got, gone from one to one to the other. Yeah. That yeah, no, it's good. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So, for example, this was the first graphic I started with while I was still playing around with things. Um, so, as you can see, these are all the sort of different um, items, yep. items, elements. And yep. I've hit, most of them have multiply, but apart from anything that's like white is a cutout, because if I multiply that, you wouldn't see the shape. So, I have to, so it's almost like a blocker. Um, on an element. So essentially what I'll, what I'll end up doing is like grouping these or making it a, uh, I just discovered my Pathfinder. Is it like the crop one or something? Oh no, it's, yep. not. it's one of these, we'll, we'll do it there. Trim. Yeah. Great. So essentially now that would be like one graphic that that can be printed as a layer. And then I, I just basically normally, well normally I group everything by color. So if I'm like nice and tidy, like this one's quite simple. So hopefully if I group all those, that works and I hit multiply, it should still look how it is printed. But I've just realized there, if I wanted this bit to be white, I would need to put another um, beetroot. Oh no, I'm just gonna duplicate it. I would put another beetroot shape in white initially on top. So that it knocks out from there. Yeah. Yeah. 
like that. You have to really think, right? You have to. How much trial? How much trial and error was there at, at the offset? How much? Oh my god, loads! Because it's just like. But to be honest, some this is where the happy accidents happen. Because then you've maybe forgotten to turn off a layer, but it prints almost more interesting than if it's too tight and too clean. It's kind of nice when. Like for example, turning off that white cutout. Actually, this is really you get these really lovely um, overprints, and I very. Yeah. Mean, it's really the process is really informed. The print process is really informed my design process. So yeah. now only really ever, even when I'm doing something for digital, I still really work in layers and with overlay. Yeah. So because it really yeah, it's, I guess it's part of the aesthetic for my the yeah. design aesthetic. Um. So yes. I don't know if I, well, let's see, what's this one? So this layer, it's like a different palette. Oh yeah, so I'll go normally like here. Oh, why is that done that? But normally I like play around and work out what colors I'm interested in. And then this is the final palette, which I've gone for, which is the Hunter Green Ink, Aqua Blue. These are fluorescents, but you can't get, because I can never recreate the fluorescents on screen. Yeah. Hence, I normally work in RGB so I can get more vivid colours on my screen. But I don't know if there's... Um, I wonder if one day we'll get, like, crazy screen... No, it's just one of those problems, unfortunately. It's really, really difficult. And fluorescents generally work relative to other colours. It's uh, And, it's of course, the printing process, the, the normal, the normal, normal, if there is a normal... The regular CMYK process used by everybody, it's, those colours aren't achievable, so you have to do a spot colour um, over the top. And you used to have to do something called a kiss plate, yeah, or a bump plate, rather. yeah. So you'd do a special plate that, that added an extra colour but bumped up the other colours in it to make it more vibrant. Of course, Resograph frees you up from that. So, yeah. yeah. Nice. I mean, what's nice with Rezo is it's, not, it's a lot more affordable than, and it's good for us even though it's designed to be a duplicator and do bigger runs, it's still aff affordable to do like 10 to 20 prints. Um, yeah. Because most of the time is in the artwork setup, but it's still fairly mechanical. So the machine will make the stencils rather than it being like screen printing where you're doing a lot of sort of physical exposure and like cleaning and solutions. The machine does it all by perforating tiny holes in the master, mm. which is like a baking paper type film. Um, so yeah, but the fluorescence, I mean, I always, I feel like I always work with them because it's such a nice, because you can't really, you don't really see um, as much fluorescence in it in digital work because it's either, is it offset? Like, I mean, I'm so bad at knowing any other type of printing. So yeah. offset printing is, is, is one that uses a succession of plates and they're all slightly off, their angles are all slightly offset from one another. So you've got a series of dots. And you've got one at a certain angle, the series of dots, then the others are offset slightly by that. And so you get an optical mixture right. of colour. That's how it works. Because sometimes, actually, I've noticed this, maybe you'll be able to um, offer some advice. So sometimes when I'm printing like a four colour, like fake sort of CMYK where you use the fluorescent pink ink, instead of the magenta magenta yeah um, but when i don't change the angles because the, with the with the printer drivers you can sort of specify the screen the, angles and the, yeah and if i don't change them you do get this like moiré effect or yeah. like things. and so is that because the angles are all the same you get a moiré yeah yeah that's one of the reasons you get you you need to just you need to just offset them by a certain amount so um, you, on each one and they're not one degree or does it need to be like no, it's generally a little bit larger than that. I think uh, it's been a while since I've had to think about this. I think it's around about 15 oh, cool. degrees in some places. But, okay. but um, yeah, we'll have a look. There's a few people actually jumped in on the chat. So Gareth jumped in before you even said it and said, Moiré <laughs> <laughs> on there. So, yeah, absolutely. By the way, um, just, just so you know, uh, there's a few people like Kirsty. Uh, saying amazing work that people are really loving uh, your work and the colours involved. Um, amazing. Uh, Sandrine is saying, have you ever uh, printed colour samples to make your own colour book for reference with the effects on gradients? That's a good thing to do, I think. Yeah, I don't have any to hand, but the 
we have some so you can buy our samples i think you just pay postage it's like 250 um but you've got all we've got 18 colors so you can in there i've made little swatch cards so you've got all the different aspects you can have you can see what it's 100 percent 75 um tw uh, 175 50 25 and what it's like with different type sizes so like the smallest you can see, I mean, I think I've got it at six point on one of the samples, but yeah. normally about seven is good. And then we've got an overlay chart, which is like a horrible beast to print. I'm reprinting them just now, but it's basically all the, it's got like a 75% along the top. I'm trying to see, I can probably pull something up for you. I'm just going to sing two lines to you, provided to me by Tim, because we did this a few weeks ago when we were chatting, just, just chatting as mates. When a grid's misaligned with another behind, that's some worry. <laughs> when the spacing is tight and the difference is slight, that's some worry. There you go. That's <laughs> a good way to learn. I understand. I mean, I've already learned a lot about them. When the lines on the screen make more lines in between, that's some worry. <laughs> no more, Tim. Stop. I'll keep doing it. <laughs> that feels so good. <laughs> but no, I mean they're all they're all good. To, and, and of course, the text. Once let's go back to your thing with the text, because otherwise it starts to look soft, right? Because you've got the interruption of the angles with the text there, so you'll start to end up with things looking soft. Got so it. do you do you do like a basic uh, like a table, effectively a color where you've got it from going like zero and in tens usually to like a hundred, and then you overlay them and they meet in the middle. Exactly. I, I find those things attractive to look at, you know. Oh, they're so nice. I mean, yeah. <laughs> the re there's like a, there's a, there's a really big Rezo community for, for all the sort of people that are printers. So there's like, we've got like a wiki, it's called Stencil Wiki for like all the Rezo nerds. But on there, I'm sure there's been exhibitions on the Rezo color charts. They're really, because every studio has a different design aesthetic or like some people are really graphic and clean and some people are a lot more DIY because the, the style of the process kind of lends itself to a lot of different styles of artwork. Um, but with that, everyone sort of made their own guides and samples, which are really, they're beautiful. And there have been yet yeah, a lot of exhibitions accordingly because it's just like, there's such lovely little artifacts as well as, having quite different, like different ways of showing, like, especially even just like the faux CMYK is lovely to yep. see the samples, cause it's like the, the fluorescent pink really pops. So the cut, the photo and there, it's just a very, it's never a reproduction, but it's a really nice um, alternative for something that's a bit, not edgy, but like just something a bit more like tactile and different. Yeah. And that's the thing, is not it? It's got that feeling about it. It's like screen printing stuff. Uh, obviously, you've got the convenience of a technology which makes it less stinky, less messy, <laughs> less all of the other things, and rapid. You don't have to wait for things to dry quite in the same way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are they super, super expensive, though, risograph, risograph, risograph machines? If I knew, I mean, I... My all my machines and drums are second hand, so they're probably. I mean, you could probably get a semi decent startup kit second hand for about five thousand pounds. It's not crazy. That's amazing. Yeah, totally, and then I mean, my first Rezo was from eBay, and it was like three hundred pounds, and it was like a really old model. It's called a GR, and it's really it was clunky. But the woman that I bought it off, or the the granny, she used to print her son's football gazettes off it, and like she just had it in. I mean, she came in in our Zimmer to the door. Um, when No way! Yeah, yeah, it was great. I mean, this was like 10 years ago. Um, I feel like now it would go for a bit more on eBay because there's definitely a trend. A lot of design studios have them in-house now yeah. because it's a really nice tool. Um, but I think because the startup costs aren't so crazy, a lot of people at least try it out. And then if it's secondhand anyway, you can maybe sell it on se secondhand again. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's in that sense, it's, it's quite an accessible... Um, sort of startup thing that is incredible that is much much uh less of an outlay than i thought yeah i mean back in the days of color photocopiers which aren't even in the same league as that you know i can remember those things in the 80s being around about 30 40 grand for one of those you know it was a serious lump of cash to drop for that but totally no with these i mean the thing is with sec a lot of, with a lot of it second hand it they can be quite temperamental so it's like on the surface, there's there's a, there's a big misconception that it's because they're quite affordable and they look like a photocopier that they're really um, easy and affordable and straightforward. But when 
like some days I can be on a print for all, like all day and it's just like trying to get one screen exposed and it's just not behaving or something mechanical goes wrong. What's nice because they're mechanical, you can kind of often fix them with my limited knowledge. It's not too, it's not like a lot of cables and wires. It's kind of more cogs and rollers. Yeah. So in that sense, it's a lot, for me, it's been a lot more accessible to try and learn and um, understand. Um, but when it does go wrong, it's like a headache. But because this com- we've got like a community of essentially creatives that run these small print studios, there's a, a really big um, sort of support network, which is great. Mm. It's it's one of the lovely things actually about having working in this um, little niche is that yeah. the, the 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 what would you call that the community is yeah. Really- it's great that I love the whole water slide of information that just comes along with that when you've got a community going there, you know, it's just everything coming down into into where you're working. Really good, really good. Amazing that that's uh, that that's so much. Um, I've just said the word flugelhorn, by the way, which is which has upset everybody because we've been trying not to say it. For a <laughs> but that's another story for another day. Uh, so yeah, no, that the people are finding this really really interesting and really. You know, really good to take a look at your work and how you do it. And uh, I should imagine that some of the people uh, are watching me are thinking Tony's going to go out and buy a risograph right now, and I probably am. <laughs> I've got some connections if you need. I'll hit you up. <laughs> Fab. Anyway, carry on. Right, so where were we <laughs> before we went down that rabbit hole? I don't know if I'm going too fast or like... No, 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 you're all good. Okay. Um, so this would be the final, this is like the final sort of version of the print. Wait, bear with me. I'm just going to move. Okay, so because we've I've flipped in and out to, oh wait, I've got my little zoom info thing at the top that I can't get. One second. How do I get, oh, there we go, it's gone. Oh, damn it. Every time I go to the top of the screen, it tries to get me into my zoom. I oh, no, no, it's tricky that, isn't it? you just got to move it out of the way, it's actually yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm just going to pretend this is like fluorescent on screen. Yep. Just enjoy my color, my color way as much as possible. I mean, fluoro orange is kind of like peach. Okay, hundred green looks good. So here, basically, I, we can turn off each layer. So essentially, this would be like the pink layer, yep. or the green, or the separation of the plate, however you want to call it. The aqua, the hunter green. Oh, which actually. I put, I add normally some trapping. Right. So because, I don't know if I should be on this one. Let's see if it is. Just because with Rezo, registration is never perfect, which is right. totally part of it. Or I try and push that as much as possible because there's only so much control me as a printer has on how, how it can register. We can shift. You can do a lot of sort of shifting on the machine, but it's still, when it fires through the printer, you can't really... There's only so much you can do, basically. So normally, you do the trap here. Do you do it in Illustrator? You do the trapping. Uh, normally, yeah. I do like I add strokes. Yeah. Um, which I actually didn't on this, but I do have it on my final. Um, so normally, I would add. One second. Back up. And normally, I'd add one. Is it two points? Is like two mil or one mil? Uh, two points is. No, I think it is about one millimeter, isn't it? Right. Yeah. In fact, if you just type one mm in there, yeah, it comes to two point eight, which is yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. And then I just make sure it's soft edges. Yeah. Um, and then that would allow for when it overlays on the green. Yeah. Um, so you can see it just now because it's multiplied, but it means that if there's any shift, there's obviously less chance that you'll see white. I mean, sometimes I really. To be honest, I do really like the, I design it so, for example, when this, I'm just going to turn all the layers back on and off register them. Like it doesn't, I mean, that one doesn't really show as much, but I quite like it even when it's um, misaligned. It kind of yeah. works in the style of the artwork and I try and um, always, I'll normally just knock stuff out of um, alignment before I separate it just to make sure it will still, it's still quite, um, it just looks, it still looks how I like it. And then, so then what I would normally do before, um, um, or get to get them ready for print is I would go back into the, my recolor 
and make everything black or a percentage of black. So if I didn't want it to print 100% inky, I would set it to like, so that would be what, 75%. Because I always work in HSP, I don't know if that's a faux pas, but I uh, normally work in HSP like this. Um, oh, I, I, it's a good model to work in, cool. you know, I think so. Because I guess for, for me and for Rezo, I guess the H is all my like, my palette essentially. And then the S is the, the S for me is like the oomph of like the Rezo fluorescentness. And then my B is just like my grayscale. Yep. Um, so I think I ended up having the pink at about 75. Basically with Rezo, if you print 100% ink, you don't really have much control over because the stencil just has it almost floods with ink. Again, I'm not I'm not te- I'm not being technically trained as a printer, so all this all this knowledge is kind of um, of my own vocabulary. But it kind of it, the ink can sort of flood and make like tide marks. So normally I try and even put even if I want it quite heavy, I'll try and set it to about ninety, just to give it a bit more. Um, type those tiny little white dots that help to regulate the ink and it not sort of yeah stuff. It also means that with overlays you get really nice. You've got you just get nicer overlays because it's not so heavy. Yeah, it gets a bit more of the show through. Um, so for example, this this is how I would do it, and then turn them off and save. So I would save that PDF as like fluoro orange, hunter green aqua blue and then pink cool. so it's quite it's quite us i don't know if it's quite crude or quite a basic way to do it but it, i guess it's kind of well my question would be does it work yes then it's fine <laughs> then it's fine yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so um, that... jackie sorry i was just gonna say jackie was just asking about what trapping is do you want to to expand on what trapping is i mean i could do it if you want but if yeah. uh, Maybe because I'm so untechnical, it's quite embarrassing. Well, no, no, it's not. It's um, uh, so trapping. When you when you print things, if you print them exactly as they are, prints move between the plates just a tiny bit, right? Even on big, really, really huge machines, they they move just a tiny bit. Uh, so to uh, stop you getting the white gaps that Cabrera was talking about, you slightly overprint the elements involved in the print. So you add something around them and that way they're trapped. The white gaps are trapped. That's how it works. There you go. So that, that wasn't technical. <laughs> normally I would put it on a few layers so I could also do it to the green, for example. Yep. So then it's like if I wanted to be super safe. I'd only normally do it to artwork that's quite tight for me anyway. So like something mm. or when customers print, when I print for customers and they've got really crisp graphic stuff. Yeah. There's sort of things you can do that sort of make it more visual friendly, as, as I would put it. Um, but each, you can, to not do it also, just, it's almost like adds to a different aesthetic or it can play up to um, what you how you'd like it to look. Um, it's, not, it's not essential, but it can make a neater result. Yeah. Does the print order matter? So when you're working with those, it does, yeah? So I also actually, with this one, I'll be quite considerate of what, so so say this is my A3 sheet here. Yeah. The Rezo feeds, um, can, you can see my little arrow, can't you? Yes, we can, yeah, yeah. So this could this would be like the main feed area. So essentially, as it's, you for every color layer you've got, it has to pass through the printer. So the more layers you have, the, the muddier the sort of rollers, the feed rollers can get. So keeping this area sort of clear as possible um, is good. But that also is something I consider when choosing what order I print in. So yeah. for example, it can be either side. So now I think I printed this one from the top. So if I turn off, so I printed, I think I printed pink and green first because I, I had this like quite clear feed area still. Normally, as well, there's the other the other way to print layers would be light to dark, which is kind of quite traditional, I think, for screen printing as well. So like yellow, pink to like darker colors. So in this, if I did it tra- just traditionally without thinking of like the feed rollers, I would do pink and flu- fluoro orange, pink, then aqua and the dark green. But because 
it was more, for me it was more about not having these roller marks which are quite um they're like a signature mark of a riso print because it's like the feed tires anything more than a two color print will probably have feed tires which you can just rub out with a rubber because it's all soy inks yeah. um, but they're quite common so like to to sort of think about orientation and layers is something um, that's pretty useful so because if i'd printed pink and orange first either here or here would create um feed marks when i print the second the next layers so normally or in this one i did orange on the last layer i think it, yeah i did pink right. first then blue and orange yep. yeah so there's kind of i mean but that's also that's me and my responsibility is also the printer. So it's like often when I get artwork that I print for other people, um, I'll just sort of look through their layers. Sometimes people specify they want specific layer orders. Um, if people don't, I'll do light to dark and or consider where it's sort of cleaner, which will sort of result in the, in the cleanest print essentially, and that's layering orders. But I try on our print guides, I sort of speak a lot about trying to keep um, keeping a white border for one because the riso can't print full bleed so yep. and that sort of sometimes when it's like it gets really inky at the top it's the, the screen starts to sort of like shrink in and you can get unevenness um, and to keep some sort of on the one area of the top or the bottom sort of semi light so it sort of hopefully ends up in a cleaner print but there's so many like my print guide is now like 30 40 pages and it's sometimes I worry it's like too intense, but then I've had like over the years, I just keep adding to it as like trial and error. And some people's prints have turned out a certain way. And I try and like share as much of that info. So when for a first time printer, basically, I think a lot of people have apprehensions because often doesn't print how they expect. But once you've printed once, you get your head around your artwork and then the result, and then it sort of informs the design process. Mm. Do you, have you ever tried making videos for it? Have you ever thought of making a video guide or two for? Well, I feel I get so self conscious. Even this is like quite a big. This feels like quite a big step for me to like show um, a bit of behind the scenes because I just like to show like the crisp finished thing and like none of the chaos that that goes on behind. But I guess it is so. I need to. I probably should. I think it would be helpful. I think, and, and do you know what the the thing is that this this is why on Adobe Live with the it's it's not a marketing thing. It's also not it's not meant to be pristine. Everybody works differently, and that's what people like to see is that you know that we all make all of us all of us make the same mistakes. Yeah. We all have things where whereas outwardly you might think, oh yes, I went like that, and suddenly it looked like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That we all know that's not the truth of the matter, yeah, and it, it and that kind of helps people to develop because if they think, all oh, right, you make the same mistakes that I make, and you know, it's a good thing. But I think you should. I think you should make little video guides for it. It'd be really good. And it would probably like it's a picture speaks a thousand words, so, and a video yeah. would be like ten thousand. I should yeah. probably um, do that because it is. It's really that's normally workshops is like i really encourage people to come in because it's like such a nice way to be hands-on like can, there's a few of us so it, and everyone's got different artwork styles and getting to be hands-on with the printer is like it really gets your head around it a lot quicker but obviously i don't know when i'll be doing workshops again hopefully soon um socially distance workshops but i think that's a yeah. really nice way to get um a good sort of especially understanding but otherwise I will consider videos for sure. Yeah, I think you should. I think I think that would be a really good thing to do. Great way to introduce people to yeah, yeah. to the yeah. work. Um, uh, there's a question from Caroline saying, um, "Where does your inspiration come from for the actual designs?" Where does it come from? Lots of different things. Probably like I love old packaging, like fifties, sixties packaging, sweetie wrappers like quite um, chunky. Oh, I actually have this, um, I got a really good book from Peter Max. I don't know if you can see. Yeah. This is so nice because maybe you can tell me actually what, how you think this is printed, but you can really see the plates. I mean, I don't know how um, close you can see. Well, I mean, I'm getting a, a, a sort of an interlaced video, but it does look like there's a lot of solid color in there. Yeah, there's lots, of, and there's like misregistration, but this kind yeah. of style of artwork, um, 
or like it's obviously he's a really famous art artist but it's also that kind of style of like chunky old print that you would also see in like old vintage um toys or like any sort of instruction manuals yeah. like, just because they're kind of there is it's, i find the, the charm is like that where it's almost not being typeset but it's like how you how you try and sort of recreate that naive not that this is naive but like that sort of I, don't know. I know, I know, I know what you mean. I'm struggling to find the word for it myself, but I do know, I do know what you mean. But yeah, it's it, you know, it's you're trying to communicate, but without having all of the the finer knowledge of how to use the tool. But you're still communicating. That's yeah. the that's the thing. I and mean, if you go back to the beginnings of of what was called the desktop publishing revolution, and look at Raygun magazine, for example, and and see how that was, you know, and back before then, the era of fanzines in the 70s and 80s you yeah. know that was that was i remember several of those you know and do it working on some of those with glue yeah. and typewriters and photocopiers to enlarge text and stick it down punk I mean, rock that that is huge <laughs> in the Rezo community because it's the print i think i mean the printers have been around since like 70s they sort of stem from gestetner um high school carbon copy paper <gasps> Gestetna, wow, yeah, 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 yeah. banders, yeah, Gestetna um, banders, and purple. I've got loads of purple carbon paper from like an old school supply, but I've yet to like. I think there's any solution to, I don't know, something's not working with it. But it's all yeah. like the Rezo process or this, um, this because Rezo also they're a company, the Japanese company that also have, com all these different types of printers, but this um, duplicator. Um, used to be used, I mean, the NHS use it or used to use it for a lot of in-house stuff. They would just have their spot color mm -hmm. and a black and churn out loads of the same, like thousands and thousands of copies. But then also a lot of people used it for zines and that, because it's so DIY, you can just scan yeah. like you would a photocopier. It really sort of, it suits that um, style. I've got a book that's full of them here somewhere. You might like that one. Um, Punk in print. Oh no, I've not seen that book. Yeah, so it's full of old fanzine artwork and stuff like that. So. That's great. Yeah. That's so cool. Because it's Check like it how to, because I'm really, because I live in Illustrator pretty much. Yeah. I'm really bad at like um, drawing or doing anything fully analog, even though the print process is analog. Yeah. Like the artwork, I never make artwork analog. And it's I find it such a barrier now because I'm so used to my sort of tools and like, the way I work digitally and it's like how to sort of I'd really like to be able to be more confident cutting pasting I don't know call, using collage or like ha like my handwriting as well has gone to pot <laughs> I think that's most of us though in this day and age I think yeah, totally. try this one as well see what screen masters screen masters right? yeah so you'll find some of the work in there that of course uses a similar approach to the way you to the to the work you do, you might find some of that to be really really interesting. There's some beautiful work in here, by the way. Some really wow. really lovely stuff. I've got to be careful because I don't want to show pe people other people's work for too long without their permission. But I'm kind of referencing it, so it's fair use. <laughs> anyway, check that out. But uh, yeah, no, it's, I mean it's it, it it's quite it is kind of edgy. The work you do, I love it. It's. It's also very tight though. I'm quite aware that I also like my, um, all my grids, but there's like, it's like a balance of having the looseness of how it'll print, like knowing that that'll be off, that'll sort of do it once it sort of get, goes to print, it'll have its own sort of, char the sort of charm gets added in the sort of um, analog process because yeah. the print is not, is never perfect. So I guess maybe it's because I sort of know that it will go through, almost passes through that, channel that makes it gives it all its sort of tactile qualities but then on screen actually it's really crisp and tight in a way yeah yeah how long have you been using illustrator just out of interest how long oh, probably like 10 12 15 years that's yeah that's a fair while it's um 10? yeah 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 I'd no, cool. Right. In InDesign. Sorry? Would you do like a layer like this in InDesign? 
Uh, personally, I would probably, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I probably would. But that's because uh, Illustrator doesn't have a concept of tables. Which and mean? So, t like, table cells, you know, so... Um, and InDesign does, so it makes layout tasks like that a lot, lot quicker. Okay. Um, but there are, I mean, you've got some really good solid reasons there for using um, for using Illustrator. Um, interesting. Yeah, I mean, you could you could you could stitch it together in InDesign. I guess you could make the artwork in Illustrator, bring it in, and stitch it all together there. But um, equally, you could create the calendar layouts in. InDesign, PDF them, and then bring the PDFs into Illustrator. So you could do that. I don't know. Yeah. That's to experiment. I shall. It's good learning, though. I almost, I almost need a pro. I need to either reset the project so it, it encourages me to learn it. I, yeah. I find it really hard to learn without sort of a output in mind or like something I need to work work towards. Yeah. But I think because these, I'll prop this year's. I mean, this is last year's. This is. This calendar is from 2020, so this was printed last year. Yeah. So I'll need to do 2021 soon, but maybe I'll give myself a bit of a learning task to do it. I have, these are the, so these would be what I sent to print actually from those calendars. Yeah. Um, so that's the fluoro pink of all the different, um, so don't, can you see my screen at the same time? Yes, we can. And Tim can switch us over so we can see it in big if you like. So. Great. So essentially that, this one is January. So you've got like the pink hands and you can see if I click this one, then you've got, on po I keep pointing at my screen and then you've got oh. the, this. I'm just going to go through them. You guys can probably um, map out. It's maybe quite interesting to sort of see them in layers. Let's see if I go to. It's really interesting to see them in layers. It's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. November is the bottom corner. Yeah. That is, this one's teal, and then this is red, and pe floral pink, you've got the gradients, and then, oh, that's teal again, yellow, oh, that's yellow there, so it's quite a soft layer. I'll do one more. Yeah. What else? So this is from this colorway, so essentially I do half the calendar in one colorway of four, and then the other so this is this bottom corner one which is july okay so that was yellow before this is now red we can sort of see i have like i put like little tints in is that would that be a kiss plate no like you know when you fill is that what you were meaning uh no i was talking I, it was actually a bump plate i was talking about earlier i said kiss plate and meant bump plate but <laughs> and that that lifts the color up so technically well i mean that's a normal regular blending Plate, but you can normally add a colour outside of the process as a bump plate. Got you. Yeah. So that's the red and then the floral pink, which I normally put in and under loads of inks because it kind of, it adds that vibrancy of the fluorescent, even if it's like at 20%, it kind of, it, it, bu it bumps the red. That's why I was asking if it's the same, because it right. kind of, when I put the pink under a lot of other colours, it kind of gives it a, another sort of glow. And that's yeah. It, I mean, it kind of is in a way because you're, well, actually, yeah, because you're dealing with solid colours, it does bump it up. Yeah. So, yeah, could be, yeah. I mean, the, the term normally applies to when you've got, um, when you're printing in CMYK, so you've got those four colours. Yeah. Normally, the fifth or sixth unit, so you've normally got five or six unit um, presses. So you've got the cyan pass, well, uh, cyan, uh, it's uh, magenta yellow, cyan black uh i think can't remember the print order now it's that long ago um and i was a single color printer anyway so i had a single i worked a single color press but normally five or six units so the last two units are normally for additional colors and finishes and then if you need any more than that it gets expensive because you have to wash the machine down you have to run tons of paper through it to make sure all of the rollers are clean 16 rollers i think in the in the feed process um so very time consuming, but so you'd, you'd think really, really hard about adding in extra colors. But if you needed to lift something up to fluorescent without adding in 
another ink to cover a fluorescent. You might have a plate, an additional spot color that bumps up the, the processes. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like the, the, the machine that I use, I mean, it has almost all those things on us, maybe a smaller, different kind of scale. Like yeah. the issues with my feed roll, well, it's, it's not the same, but it's nice to hear about other processes. Oh, no, they are. Rollers are rollers. It doesn't matter what what set of, what kind of printing you're involved with. They're all the same problems. If you've got a, a sticky sticky roller or you've got something that didn't quite clean, you know, uh, yeah, really bad. I had somebody, I went on holiday once from the print shop I worked at a couple of weeks came back to find no work had moved on uh, and that my press was ruined because uh, they'd used water to clean the font rollers and they were water soluble. So you were only meant to clean them with alcohol. Yeah. But they hadn't, they just, you know, uh, they cleaned it with water, run the press. And of course they just became instantly super sticky mm. and the whole top roller set had to come out and get so, replaced. Or yeah to get replaced yeah and it was it was you know it was it was a lot of money yeah um, and they had to go to a different job somewhere else we sent them to a farm to live on a farm <laughs> that doesn't sound so bad <laughs> i have no idea where they went i've no idea where they went but uh it, oh man it's very difficult but anyway no so they're, they're they're common problem small print processes i don't know any print process that doesn't involve rollers really even woodcut and lino involves rollers because you've got pressure. And so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Interesting. Yeah. So that is, yep. I mean, I've kind of gone through lots of different elements of it, but I don't know if there's anything that, if there's any questions. Uh, well, there are plenty of things going on. One of the first question I've got to ask you is, will you come back again? Sure. Perfect. Right. So that answers a question for Angus and myself. And Tim has just said that, that you will anyway. So there you go. That will, that will teach me for not looking at the calendar. <laughs> uh, let's have a quick look through. So uh, a farm in Wales, says says Gareth Hanks. That's an analogy for but anyway. Doesn't Let's leave that. Uh, lots of people remember the smell of cleaning out drums on different things uh there was questions about the typesetting on the um calendars but we kind of looked at that um spirit duplicators so that would be like a gestetner Is that it right? would be like a gestetner yeah yeah it would yeah God, those things where the, the whole banda thing where pe people typists back in the day people with like an actual mechanical typewriter would have to be really heavy handed to cut through to create that stencil to go on those things. And I think they'd they'd run out after something like a thousand prints. So you'd have to cut them all over again. Whoa. It's just crazy, crazy stuff. Mind you, most things, even lino prints and things like that, even they wear out over time. So, you know, but it's just nice that you've got a fabulous digital um process people also are loving the fact that you as well as being a, a fab designer that you are a technical printer because it means you have to think about what you do so people are loving that uh yeah, as well it, it, I, I mean the fact that i set it up it's because i think if i just did design all day i would be so i really like being hands-on and also not i don't know if i don't know if everyone's out there is a mixture but for me, just doing, I like being able to also do stuff that, that uses my brain in a different way. So I'm not having to think sometimes, or it's yeah. like, I'm just folding. Like I really like the balance that the studio gives me, whether it's like even just packing orders or like, as well as doing some admin, I really love a spreadsheet. So it's like a nice, it sort of gives me a bit of a vehicle to do all the different things that I think if I just did one of those things, I would go mad. So it is nice that it's a bit of a balance. I love that it informs your work as well, that the process of doing it, because this is something that industrially is a hot, is a gap. And that's because people don't get to do, uh, maybe if they go to London College of Communication, maybe uh, then, um, which has always been the, the, the place of excellence in England anyway, the place of, of excellence for that. Um, did Where did you go? Gla did you actually study in Glasgow? I was gonna say, because Glasgow is an excellent place, of course, in, yeah. in, in Scotland. Um, but yeah, people don't get to do it and they go out into the big wide world and then they create designs 
which are completely unprintable. <laughs> You've got to, and that's harsh because yeah. it's it's crushing. I think when you come out of college, you're full of bright ideas. Someone's hired you to do something. You do it only to get a printer come back to you. Uh, no. <laughs> and then you, you start to doubt yourself and all of that. But, you know, you've grabbed that by the horns, literally. But it's one, that's the thing, though. So I get jobs and I have to print digital. I am like a rabbit in the headlights. I get everything wrong. I'm like, and it's so, for some people, it's so basic. But for me, because this is like, I've been just doing Rezo for so long. This is like almost, I find it even screen, when I've done some screen printing, I'm like, they'll pack the, the trans, because Rezo inks always have a very certain translucency. Yeah. Um, screen printing inks, you can, you can sort of ch like change, you can sort of change. You can, you can thin them. Yeah, you can, you can thin them. That's that yeah. level of control that I'm not used to being in, in control of. Yeah. Like, so there is, I think that's why I really like it. It's got very specific parameters that I can, and I guess over the years I just keep, I find it interesting because you can keep finding like new ways to make, to get blends or like play with gradients within mm. a very sort of rigid process that I really, um, that I find really um, enjoyable to sort of play with. That's, I think, uh, so screen printing was the first kind of printing that I, I did. Well, apart from potato printing, as well as when I was about seven. But <laughs> screen printing, I, it's cut, for me, is like painting at volume. Because you can do things like little tricks with the squeegee to just change, even an angle to change if you're doing something in a blend. And it makes that output individual. That's and that's that's the beauty of print, I think, in that that particular form of printing. But if you've you've got a known um, consistency, so if people think that CMYK is consistent, but CMYK isn't consistent because it depends on what inks you buy from what manufacturer and how much actual pigment they're using in there against the suspension. So, you know, this is the thing: you send something out across the world. There are some people who do whole numbers for print for prints. Right. So they only in Illustrator, they'll only do whole numbers. They won't have any decimals in there and things like that, which is a, which is a, an interesting thing. Let's let's leave it at that. But um, and then they go to different different parts of the world and see their work and it just looks slightly different. And it's because the ink is a different thing. So at least yeah. you've got a known, you know, which is which is good. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, a quick question, if I might, from um, Gareth. I think it was asking this earlier on. Was um, do you use uh, to, when you're when you're sketching stuff out? Do you use uh, Fresco? That was the question. I don't no? know what Fresco is. It's an iPad app. It's an iPad drawing app from Adobe. I just oh, I've seen this. I was actually quite tempted because maybe that's like a bit of a bridge for me to get better with like a pen. My sort of I don't know. It's a bit of a I don't know. It's like a transition between the analog and digital somehow. But I yeah. only use, I don't even really use the pen tool much. I'll sort of make shapes, lag trace stuff, and then play around with the um, what anchors to make yeah. it draw, essentially. Yeah. But no, I mean, this was probably something also that could be quite fun to sort of, when I'm stuck, to look you're at. You're also, you're big on the, the kindergarten as well, aren't you, right? By learn through play and, exactly. and develop your work through play. Yeah. And limitation yeah. and built and sort of having these sort of set of tools. I think for me, that's why I really liked that the notion of the kindergarten or like early um, ideas around it, sort of having these rules to play with. So you've got to still, I mean, it's still quite, um, I still like the sort of strictness of it. But then what you can do when you've only got like five sticks and like all the different sort of combinations you can sort of do with one shape, for example. So it's that, again, that limitation that I like with the Rezo, but also within like even elements or polka dot. I mean, I use the polka dot so much, but it's like how you can sort of keep reiterating into different, with di and it sort of can look different and blends and with the process and things like that. No, boundaries are good. I think boundaries are good. And that, they, you know, if you kind of know you can't go past that point, it makes you more creative uh, in between. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, let's just have a quick, uh, just one quick last look. So we're just about a minute out before the top of the hour. Uh, here, uh, you can print silly stuff like glitter or pearly stuff in silkscreen. True, 
special finishes really really nice uh, smelly ink and scratch cards <laughs> I've never tried that uh, you can also print glue and stick gold sheets on it yeah, there's lots of things uh, what's Tim putting in now screen printing that must have been before Tony's career as a unicycle expert I could even pop a wheelie there you go that's my alternate career for today <laughs> oh, Gabriella it has been absolutely enchanting to have you on with us today thank you so much Thank you for having me. I was honestly quite nervous. Oh, no, everybody's loved you here. It's been, it's really been brilliant. Really brilliant. Um, you can, for those of you in the community, don't forget, you can join us in our Discord after the chat. And link, Tim has just popped the link into the chat just there so it can carry on all day and all night and all weekend, uh, if you so feel like it. There's some great streams coming along uh, next week. But for now, Gabriella, it's been, like I said, enchanting to have you with us. I can't wait until you're back next time so thank you thank you all right okay everybody have a great weekend stay safe stay creative see you soon bye